Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This is the third webinar for three different sessions. We have gone through different experiences, leveraging the guidelines that we published in the UNODC last year, which gives us some sort of path or guideline for countries and institutions to support, provide technical support or for countries to create their own information, generate their own information. This decision is to learn from experience of three institutions that are quite relevant at a regional level. So without further ado, I would like to start with the first intervention. We have very three excellent speakers. We have Lieutenant Diego Lamarín from the section of uh, security and justice, and that is part of the Inter American uh, and Development Network. Without further ado, Lieutenant, we will pass it over to you so you can we can learn from your experience in the region. Just one more thing for those that are joining us. Lieutenant's presentation is going to be in Spanish, but Erica's presentation is going to be in English. For those that would like to listen in Spanish, you can uh, select your preferred language in the globe icon that reads interpretation. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let me just share my screen with all of you. There you go. Hello, good morning, everyone. I am Lieutenant Diego Villamarín. I am currently working in the American State Organization, specifically for the security and justice um, area that is in charge of Red Poll. Red Poll, I would like to explain to you what Red Poll is, an inter-American uh, network for uh, the police department that was created by the American State Organization within the framework of the fifth meeting of the ministers in Lima, that it is called MISPAP, MISPAP 5 since 2015, in a seek for space where there's a possibility of creating uh, or exchanging information, good practices, proper training, and especially a horizontal cooperation uh, on behalf of the police organizations in the region. So this was for, this was created to start with a uh, comprehensive network to support police departments in the region. These red poll from the OAS, it is based on, first of all, uh, virtual and in-presence training courses responding to the needs for knowledge. The second part is the sub-regional seminars and horizontal cooperation for exchanging experiences, good practices, the third one, we have a virtual network, a virtual platform, which is absolutely important for the exchanging and cooperation and collaboration. And number four is the certification in uh, police excellence standards. So I am now working as a representative of the Red Poll, and we are in a in a series of networks in that are inter-American and regional for police departments. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this very important and, pa and passionate topic, which is the um, leveraging of statistical information for to improve the uh, police departments. You know that um, Time is very important and we have very short time and we have to address a lot of topics that is very uh, that we are all passionate about. My presentation will be cover five different topics. I'm going to talk about the importance of statistics for police management. The pro number two is information uh, processes uh, systematization. Number three, the main um, concerns that we have seen at a regional level. Number four, regional plan from the organizations of American states uh, at a recommendations level. And the last one, and this is to provide a conclusion, I'm going to speak about the challenges that we have faced at a regional level that we're currently facing in at, at a regional level. 
As police officers, we need to understand, and this is such a, a, a passioning and a fundamental topic because statistics provide all the tools to do our work. We cannot just think about working or uh, uh, having the management or uh, doing our public work without statistics. Because the first thing we have to think about is once we get a territory, we need a diagnosis. We need to understand what's going on and diagnosis are based on the statistics and the analysis of data. Once we go through all these processes and they are more attached to the reality, we realize that each territory is different in each one of the states and each one of the countries, each territory is different. The South, the Central Park, the, the coast, the uh, uh, Deans, uh, they are completely different realities under very different circumstances. And the only thing that a proper diagnosis can provide is data and data that is well systemized, analyzed, and processed. For the design without a database, we are completely lost. Data allows us to create strategies, variables, indicators based on information. It allows us to understand what are the resources that we're going to need and where to allocate them. Without data, we would be completely and absolutely lost. In the implementation, I think that at a political level, at a, man a managerial and political level, it's also very important because at a political level, where if we want to create a public policy without data, we are again completely lost. At a managerial, at a police department level, our commanders, our operations directors, people that are creating the operations um, design, they need to understand what's going on in the different territories to provide clear guidance and provide clear strategies to the different commanders and the commanders of the different territories, even police officers at a, a investigation and preventive levels, they have to understand what's happening and who uh, who is in charge of this data. So this is again from the previous practice in the police department that will go uh, out as, a, as police officers and just see what where we can be able to prevent or uh, avoid, but that's no longer our reality. So implementation, evaluation is very important because we must understand that if everything that we have designed and implemented is actually happening and meeting the goals. So this is something that is very important that we have very serious at a Latin American country be, uh, uh, level because we don't know how we are using our resources, whether they are being properly used and what are the strategies that are actually working. But what should we do at a regional level in order to get data that is worth it, that we are not losing information, that it allows us to have a comprehensive pr perspective or uh, overview of the issues. And in accordance to what I have heard, in accordance of my experience being 27 years in the institution, this is what I have gone through, like four very specific steps that are very relevant. Number one is a survey. Who is being in charge of surveying this information, collecting, gathering the information? So how is this being received? So this is one of the first essential steps for a proper uh, piece of data, because most of the times the person that is uh, producing the report or that is actually going and report something and they do flat files and some in some sort of manner they're losing information that is crucial that will provide a better perspective of what is actually happening in the territory. The second step is classification, which is very important. How do we classify data? We need manuals of conceptualization. We need to understand and conceptualize facts 
in a very specific manner in such a way that when we collect data, it doesn't matter if it's north, south, east, or west, they are all sorted on the same fashion. The person that is sorting this data that is clearly understand how it's happening and they, uh, uh, we do not have mixed data or lost data. As a third step, we have automation. We have seen throughout this seminar and for the regional experiences that we have heard about, we have police departments that have a lot of automation. They don't no longer use flat files that we used to work with years ago. And many of the colleagues at a regional level spoke about it where claims or reports were only capturing a spreadsheet, and then we will get the dynamic tables, and we will get some sort of report of understanding what was happening and what are the crimes in a higher um, uh, likelihood, et cetera. But now automation, it's fundamental because this allows us to get real-time data national data and georeference data, which is also very important. But all these processes need to come with a validation. And validation is really important because validation cannot be for only one institution. It has to include other institutions that are around this phenomenon. Sometimes not only the prosecutor's office or the police department, the observatory, the judiciary, the person in charge of the national statistics, no, we need to have committees where they can actually validate the different processes. Now, what are the main... I think that at a regional level, in more or less... Um, measure there in several issues or concerns, but I have summarized them in six. Sometimes we have countries where we have different statistical analysis. On one hand, we have the news from the observatory, from the prosecutor's office, from the judiciary, from the police department. Each one has its own uh, news to the crime, and sometimes these don't even match. This is one of the main problems. The processes to uh, collect the information are for low quality. Why? Because sometimes we don't have management systems, but as we spoke before, we only have flat files because we have no conceptualization manuals that are clearly defined, that are properly structured and built by experts and that they are proofed, especially. Sometimes in some countries, we relate the incidency of the crime with a score for the police department, meaning that the more crime, the less score the police gets. And what is the phenomenon that leads us to that? The fact that the police officer starts hiding data. So I want to leave the question completely open. Can these be related? Is this... Is there is a deep analysis before this question because there might be different positions in this regard. Now let's pick let's let's picture institutions that have the the news about the crime, that they have collection of data with high quality processes. They already have the conceptualization manuals or awareness manual. They have this is this is not related to the police note with the incidences. But then we have a more critical problem here, which is the black figure or those events that have not been reported. At a Latin American level, we can say that we have 70 to 80 percent of crimes that have not been reported, meaning that we use data from 20 to 30 percent of what is actually happening on streets or in the different states. And if from these 20 or 30 percent is not properly managed or handled, imagine how many data we're using incorrectly to make decisions for public policies. This is the reason why there is a high level of impunity and deficiency in public policies because of the lack of data, because of the lack of, um, of or, or the reason why we have these big phenomena. As we are all aware, homicide is one of its 
y de política pública. El the, the rate of homicides, it is the, um, uh, the, the benchmark, benchmark for criminality in our countries, right? So if we speak about data, statistics, analysis, um, we can say that we have produced plan, this plan of uh, action plan to orientate the elaboration of public policies to prevent or reduce intentional homicide. So this means that all the states that are uh, members of the OAS are going to be included in this plan. And I brought to you the main recommendations out of this plan, focusing on the statistics. And I would like to quote here, the first one and the first recommendation is regarding generating data and information regarding intentional homicide, characteristics of the fact, victims, and perpetrators, relation between perpetrators and victims, and uh, connects crimes to improve quality of data of the homicide, applying international quality standards, also to create evidence of the, about the implementation uh, about the implementation efficiency of the policies and actions to prevent and reduce intentional homicide throughout rigorous methodologies of monitoring and evaluation of the uh, results of impact foster the use of information and the scientific evidence amongst public officers to construct diagnose, uh, comprehensive diagnosis, um, design of public policies and decision-making, monitoring and evaluation of such by um, accountability and transparency to deliver timely quality data regarding an intentional homicide that are um, in daily basis. And finally, the three recommendations that we have out of the whole document is to promote and strengthen the establishment of mechanisms that allow us to share the information, generate information regarding the efficiency of the ju criminal justice processes from the reporting all the way to sentence of, in the process of rehabilitation and social in insertion of, um, of the uh, perpetrators document and document policies and implemented actions and um, evaluated actions to foster the exchange of information as well as good practices and lessons learned. And finally, this is as a conclusion because you know that we have very short time here. I believe that we are facing challenges at our regional level. Let me give you six very quickly, I want to go over them, and I believe these are the most important ones. The first one is to improve recollection and data analysis processes. This is regarding uh, reception of reporting, reports or claims. This is very important to be able to collect the, the highest amount of information to start accounting for other kind of data, which provide because we have a high amount of black figures. We need to start looking for other sources of information to try to do a cross check and to uh, get the more data as possible in order to achieve better diagnosis, better public policies, better strategies like the data provided by 9-11 and social media and also community assemblies, which are those spaces that are very rich regarding the information they can provide to us. Also, automation of systems, automation of systems in those countries where we still working with hard copies, integrating systems and have one single news to the crime. As I said before, we still have different ways and we find news or notes of the uh, a crime at a different institutions. One other big challenge is professionalization. You know that there's a lot of articles and papers that speak about the analysts, but the analysts have to be professional and specialized. I heard Colombia last time that there that there's people 
with 15 years in the system and with two masters. And this is exactly good practices that we need to replicate at all police departments. Start with a specialization and to keep these people in their working uh, places. Also conceptualization manuals to avoid information to get lost. And for they all conceptualize from the same with the, the same well facts with the same characteristics also people that are receiving the reports need to have a proper knowledge to try to record as much information as possible that would then allow us to describe comprehensively the phenomena that is happening in the third place looking to improve trust in the institutions i think build uh, um, uh, looking for improving the trust in the institutions by reducing impunity and improving perceptions of insecurity this is one of the big challenges that we have at an institutional level also look for uh, having transparent data with accountability to build proper evaluation processes for each one of the strategies and public policies that are being uh, produced. Because I repeat, it's not the same to have a public uh, public policy in one city versus another one because realities are different. And this is why we need data to understand what are, or to establish clear diagnosis that allow us to have a comprehensive perspective of the phenomenon. Also to start thinking prospectively because there are several crimes that have been completely invisible, such as gender violence, um, sexual violence, where we need to provide deeper follow-up. We also have cybersecurity cr uh, crimes. We are getting into that uh, with very high frequency. Also, organized crime, where we need to find better variables to start addressing and analyzing these topics of new way of uh, crimes in the organized crime environment. Also, interoperability systems among institutions for in order to be automated. So I think that we're running out of time, but I believe that this last conclusion is one of the most important ones, and it is to, um, to leverage and to have information and good practices exchange. Because if we listen to the experiences from others and looking for what has happened in our brother states. And I believe that we can all together start improving the regions, getting better data to allocate resources, and also trying to use these resources in a much better fashion. And these are the spaces that are ideal in order to try to integrate our experiences. Again, I am Lieutenant Diego Villamarín. I am um, working directly in the Red Pole from the Organization of American States. Please let me know if you need anything. We're here to help you, to support you, to make this network uh, a network that will help us to collaborate with other police departments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you for sharing your experiences. You provided a mapping, and you're not only talking about the coordination mechanisms that the Organization of American State provide, but where they bring different institutions in terms of public security for articulating the generation information to be used in different public interventions. Before we move on to our next participant, there was a question for you in the Q&A um, uh, function. Maybe you can look at it and maybe we can go back and you can provide a response. Next one, and we are now going to be sharing the experience from the country. This is from Bureau of Justice Statistics from the United States for the uh, Chief for uh, Statistical of Police Incidents Unit, Ms. Erica Smith. 
Erica. Floor is yours. And thanks again for sharing with us. Hi, your good morning. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to join you here. Let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the work that we're doing at BJS, um, working with police incident data. Um, we have been working very closely. My agency, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, is the statistical arm of the Department of Justice. And we've been working very closely with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who collects all of the crime incident data reported by police agencies throughout the country, um, in order to expand the number of agencies that actually provide that incident level data. So records on each of the um, crimes that are recorded by those agencies throughout the country, um, in order to improve our understanding of um, crime that comes to the attention of police. So what I would like to accomplish today is to give you a bit of a background about NIBRS and the analytic capabilities of the data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the incident-based um, system itself and how many agencies are participating and how those data are reported, um, as that has a big impact on the quality of the information. Um, and then I want to talk a bit about the benefits of those data for understanding crime um, in, in its place and how we're able to, how we're trying to work with those data, I should say, um, at the local, state, and national levels to provide some additional insight um, and, and create an evidence base for practitioners and researchers to use these data. So a little bit of a, of a quick primer here on the differences um, on, on our old system, which was the SRS, the summary reporting system, and the new system, um, which has actually been around for quite a while, but we're, we're really pushing agencies to make the transition to this new way of reporting. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but it's here for reference for folks who are interested. Um, we've been reporting um, just aggregate summary counts of crime for um, over 90 years to the FBI. So this has been things like the total number of homicides, the total number of rapes, the total number of burglaries. Um, and we call it sort of the big seven offenses um, that we've been collecting for a very long time. Under NIBRS, um, the move to the National Incident-Based Reporting System, um, this incident-based way of collecting data, we would not only get a count of the number of agencies, uh, or the number, excuse me, of um, homicides, for instance, that occurred, we would also get a record about each and every homicide that was reported, and that would include um, a bunch of additional details about the offense. I'm going to kind of walk through that right now. Um, so these are the offenses that are sort of our critical offenses that are collected within the NIBR system um, that we report out on. So you can see, um, for the most part, these are the things that you would expect to see. Um, you know, some of the high level uh, crimes against persons include, you know, including sort of the general violent crimes, um, crimes against property. Um, and we, and NIBRS also collects information about the type of property and the amount of property lost and things of that nature to have an understanding of the harm that came to the victim in that particular incident. And then other crimes against society that will tell us something about um, potentially the level of disorder or dysfunction within a community um, when we have the data. And then some of the additional indicators that we really want to capitalize on are those things that we learn about individuals within the incident and then the incident characteristics itself themselves. So we learn through this particular data collection that um, you know, a lot of information about the victim and the offender. Um, if an arrest was made, we get that information as well. And then we also get an understanding of um, the victim offender relationship. So what's that interconnection between the victim and the alleged offender or the arrestee? And then we also get a lot of additional information about the characteristics of the incidents themselves, where they occurred, when they occurred, if a weapon was involved, um, if there was any kind of bias motivation um, that was identified by the law enforcement agency to um, classify that as a hate crime, and if, the inf and if the incident was cleared through an arrest or some other type of exceptional clearance. So 
this really, these data really help enhance our understanding of the kinds of victimizations that are being reported to the police and what the police are actually founding and then recording in their own systems. Gives us a chance to look at what is happening within a particular community or a geography. And we're able to then link other data to that place and get a better understanding of the context in, when, in which these victimizations are occurring. We can also look at things like patterns and clearance rates um, and the, the types of victims being, um, like the characteristics of, of the victims in a place and then the characteristics of the offender to understand the patterns in our justice system inputs and outputs, um, which will give us greater insight into sort of programming and the potential impacts of programming at the local level. And then, you know, we're also able to look at a wider variety of offenses instead of the seven where we have these, you know, aggregate counts of the total number of, ins of, um, of offenses, we're actually able to look at incidents, offenses, and victimizations at this really, um, you know, finite, detailed level of, uh, you know, within the incident. So I want to talk a little bit about the actual process that agencies use to report. Um, I know that um, that you know in this in this federated system where the federal government is um, really relying on the voluntary submission of data, um, this part of the process is really very important. So I'm actually going to start um, over here on the right hand side of the slide to talk a little bit about how the data flow from one place to the other. So the data start obviously within the local law enforcement agency, um, that's going to include a number of different types of agencies that would then um, take data from their record management system and pull that out in some sort of submission format and send that then on to, <clears throat> excuse me, an individual state uniform crime reporting program. So it goes from the local level to the state and there's a transformation process within that um, that occurs so that the data from the local agency adheres to the requirements of the state program. The state program then takes those data from however many law enforcement agencies are in the state. So for instance, um, in the state of California, I believe there are roughly between six and 700 law enforcement agencies that would need to send their data to the state program. And the state program would aggregate all of that together maybe make some transformation so that it, it adheres to the requirements of the federal FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Program down here. Um, and then that information is reported, uh, or and then and they report that over to the FBI. And the FBI aggregates that across all 50 states um, and several of the territories that participate in the program. Um, and so at each stage in the at each stage in the process, there's a possibility that there's a slight shift in the information. And so we really have to be careful to um, evaluate the fidelity of those changes from one layer to another. Um, and then to look here on the left hand side, um, I believe this is relatively similar um, to what uh, Lieutenant Via Marine was speaking about um, in terms of how the data um, are reported um, in his in his country as well. So we have a reported crime incident um, and there are some critical questions there. What's the source of the information? So how is information about that particular crime incident entering the system? And then this other question of was the incident founded? Um, and if it was, if it was considered to be a crime incident that needed to be recorded, was a report taken so that that information would actually enter the agency's record management system? And then we've got sort of these subsets here, which is once it's determined if a record is made and we actually are going to learn about that crime, there are these additional um, layers of uh, data entry that impact the quality and completeness of the data themselves. Um, first is the initial incident information. Um, as many of you are aware of, you know, like dealing with these types of data, you know, criminal justice data sort of generally, the information you learn at the very beginning of um, a crime incident report may not actually be the reality of the situation. And so that information may change over time. So the initial incident information and the quality of that and how it comes in is critically important to you know, how 
how much we can rely on that information as it moves forward in the system, um, specifically related to making changes and updates to that record with follow-up investigative findings. Um, and then there are sort of these other downstream considerations that you can't really know all the time at the time of the incident. Was an arrest made or was the incident cleared? If there was no arrest made on site, was that record ever updated to provide information about an arrest or a clearance? Um, and then other changes that may also um, affect the information that's reported about the incident. Were there any additional offenses that were identified? Was the victim injured and that injury status changed over time? You know, for instance, did the if the victim died, did the offense get updated from an, a, from an aggravated assault to a murder, um, if that was applicable? Things like that, that we really, um, you know, have to try to understand how those processes within the local agency impact the data that come to us, you know, at the end of the year through the federal um, crime reporting program. And, and this is just a brief um, sort of overview of how the type of system that an agency uses actually has a pretty big, it can have anyway, an impact on um, the, the quality and completeness of the information in the system. Um, you know, an ability to track things over time and have investigative data automatically update a record, um, being able to, uh, you know, provide some uh, updates when the initial record was not, was not formally completed and being able to get that back to the responding officer to make updates to the record, things of that nature. And then also the age of the system itself. When we have, we've run across older systems that are being operated by local law enforcement agencies, they don't often have the ability to provide all of the required elements that the federal program needs in order for an agency to be considered a reporting agency. So I wanna just look really quickly at our current coverage. So I know I've kind of um, talked a little bit about maybe uh, you know the limitations, but this is still a system that provides so much more insight into crime at the local level. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about how many agencies are reporting. So um, without worrying really too much about what the what numbers lie behind all this, although if, if you're interested in specific coverage rates, I'm happy to provide that information. But um, what I really want the takeaway to be here is that we have about 75% of the population of the United States covered. Um, there are some states that are 100% reporters where all the agencies in the state are reporting in the, the, in the NIVERS format with all of this detail. In some states that are, um, and those are the ones in the green, the darker green being a lower level of coverage, um, that are still working to ramp things up. Um, one thing I will point out here is that um, uh, the state of New York actually will definitely move, um, move up in its coverage rate because our largest agency um, in the country is the New York City Police Department. Um, and they have recently uh, started reporting to the NIBR system and they will be in the data for the data year of 2023 that we're in right now. So that's a big, a big win for the system in and of itself. So let's talk a little bit about what we can actually know through the system. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go through these really quickly because I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but I just want to show you, give you a flavor of the things that my agency and my staff are trying to do with these data to really um, provide some greater insight into some of our more um, you know, intractable sort of issues that we have within uh, criminal victimization. So the first one I wanna talk about is intimate partner violence. So this is all very preliminary um, and these are just you know, mock-ups right now. This is nothing um, you know, final. But I want to just show you a little bit about what we've drawn up for um, intimate partner violence. We have a dashboard that we're working on right now. It's a proof of concept, just looking at three states right now. So what you're seeing here is um, preliminary for Michigan for the year of 2021, just to as we work to mock these things up. Um, and you'll see we are showing an overall victimization rate per 100,000 persons in the state. You have an ability to look here in this donut chart at the types of relationships that um, 
are uh, the types of victim offender relationships that are occurring among these violent incidents um, in the state of Michigan. This specifically here is for female victims. Um, and then another view, you can click on this, and this is not interactive, these are just screenshots, but you'd be able to click on the male and see those differences. Um, and then we're looking at these rates by victim offender relationship and the victim age. So you can see sort of these, um, the intimate partner line is the blue line. So overall, the friend and acquaintance line is much higher. Um, that's the largest type of victimization in the state of Michigan um, when it comes to violent victimization being perpetrated by a friend or an acquaintance. And you can sort of see how these things change over the life of a um, of victim, victim age. The next view is just showing how this donut chart changed when you click on the male rate um, and, and here as well, the um, some of those op changes you'll see in the dashboard. Um, and then the next view is looking specifically at the um, race by gender. So, um, and then race or gender by age, or excuse me, gender by race and gender by age down here. So this, the blue bars are the female victimizations and the yellow are the male. And you'll see that they follow a somewhat similar pattern. There are some differences there, but you can see the relative magnitude of difference in the rates um, for both of those, um, for the males and females particularly. Um, and then this just shows some additional information. This will all be interactive by offense type and relationship type. And you'll see, you know, these yellow bars are those incidents that occurred within a residence and the blue are those that occurred outside of a residence at some other non-residence location. Um, so we're trying to really provide a quick snapshot of this particular offense type in order to um, give folks a much better understanding of what's going on within um, intimate partner violence victimizations overall. Uh, another another uh, type of violence that we want to really dive into and that we have much more detailed data on within the NIBR system is gun violence, um, both fatal and non-fatal. So for a long time, we've had um, incident-based data that was collected by the federal government through the FBI's program on fatal violence, on murder, um, where we would be able to take a look at murders that involves a gun. Um, but with NIBRS, we theoretically get um, information about whether a gun was used in any type of incident. Um, so we've been able to take a look at non-fatal violent victimizations that involve a firearm. Um, and so this mock-up, again, this is not final data, but this is just to give you a flavor of what we're trying to work with. Um, this is for the states that are in green um, are the states that for 2021, we had all, all the data for. So we're really only looking at those states where all of the agencies report their data to the NIBRS system. Um, and you can see the, the different um, coloring scheme here is that the darker green has a higher rate of non-fatal gun violence than the lighter green states. And then we can also take a look at it specifically for fatal gun violence, um, those murders or those murders and non-negligent manslaughters that involved a firearm and the darker sort of pinkish color, I guess, fuchsia um, are those that have um, a higher rate of firearm involved um, fatal victimizations. And we can also take a look at this within state and we can see where things tend to coalesce. Um, not surprisingly, the largest cities are where those biggest bubbles end up showing up for a large, you know, indicating a, a larger magnitude in terms of the total number of victimizations. Um, and so you'll see he, this is for violent victimizations involving a firearm in the, um, in the state of Missouri um, around St. Louis and um, Kansas City, Missouri specifically. And then a similar um, yet smaller map, I would say smaller number of dots anyway, on the map for those fatal murders. And one of the other critical things that we can do with NIBRS is we can actually calculate rates um, use, you know, for specific um, demographic categories. So you can see here, we can break it out by the victim race and then a number of these different age categories to see where um, in some ways sort of the greatest risk 
is for um, each of these particular uh, demographic groups within a state. So again, not final data, but preliminary analysis of data in Arkansas for 2021. You can see the largest um, category of victim is uh, a, a black victim between the ages of 18 to 24. We can see that overwhelmingly um, the line for black victims, regardless of age, is always higher and that that really um, mostly pertains to murder as well. Um, and so we can start to really unpack that if we can get down to lower levels of geography as well with these data. Um, and something we're trying to do to provide information back to um, law enforcement agencies is to provide them, oops, let me go back one slide, is to provide them some information um, using their own data. So we're, uh, we'll, next year, early next year, hopefully, <laughs> we'll be launching a uh, website called the, the Learn site. It's the Law Enforcement Analytic Resource Network, where agencies will be able to submit their own much more real-time data along with geocodes. Um, and then we will have mechanisms within that learn site for them to choose a report that they would like to um, they would like to have their data applied to. And then we will take those data. They will be um, processed, and then a report will be sent back to the agency. The goal is to really make this a pretty quick process for them and get them a report back within um, five to ten minutes of time. Um, and the first uh, report that we're working on is, a uh, tactical crime analysis uh, tool for residential burglary. Um, and I'm not going to go through all these visuals, but I just wanted to give a flavor of what we're trying to do here, showing overall trends, some specific information about victimizations, and then looking at sort of the time and place that residential burglaries occur, um, providing some change over time, depending on the time frame, uh, you know, the amount of data that an agency actually provides to the system um, will modify what kind of trends we're going to be able to show them. Um, but really trying to get a better understanding over to them of, you know, sort of what are these patterns in residential burglary within their own um, specific jurisdiction. Um, and then if they're able to provide geocoded data, we'll also be able to provide the maps. Um, if they cannot provide the geocodes, uh, the maps won't appear, but we'll still be able to provide a lot of this other information um, based on the data specifications that we've put out. So in terms of how we're moving forward, um, the big thing that we're pushing on right now, given that we're at about 75 percent coverage with these data of the country and that that it'll probably be around 84 to 85 percent of the country um, with data for 2023, um, because we're at a relatively higher threshold um, in terms of coverage, we're now looking at how to really improve access to this information. We want to build this crime data infrastructure that allows others to contribute to the evidence base. We don't want to be the only ones sort of working with these data. Um, but because there, it's a big data set, it's relatively cumbersome. We really want to, you know, provide these tools, data tools. Uh, we have a, a big one out that I didn't even talk about here, where we're, um, you know, we visualize all of the data for the country, and you can do your own analytics. Um, you know, so we're really trying to uh, capitalize on the information and use in the use of data visualization software to apply to these data so that it. Um, creates a path for others to actually interact with the information and use it um, more than it has been historically. Um, and similar to, uh, again, what Lieutenant Via Marine had, had mentioned in his um, presentation, we have on the, on the horizon um, other data collections that will sort of round out um, a broader understanding of crime data reported by the police. Uh, the first one up for us is police calls for service data, things like 911 contributions and computer aided dispatch data. Um, we're exploring how to bring all of that into um, a system th at the federal level so that we can begin to parse out what it is that police are actually dealing with on a day to day basis and how that impacts um, what we see in the crime data moving forward as a totally, you know, sort of as a subset, I guess, of calls for service data. 
Um, and so with that, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing and to learn from um, these other presentations. I, I really appreciate it. Um, my contact information is here. And if anyone would like a copy of these slides, I'd be happy to provide that as well. So thank you very much. Adriana, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thanks again for sharing uh, the, this very detailed experience, but also sharing uh, the need to modernize or to update systems that maybe have been relevant at some point of the time, but that we need to adjust to a different situations. And also, it was uh, I would like to highlight a couple of things that you mentioned just to open the discussions to the people that are participating here. But um, how you consider different phases of, uh, of the reporting process and the considerations and how to move from maybe an, an aggravated assault to a homicide or because someone is dying. Also to highlight the, the importance of linking different institutions uh, outside, let's say, the, the security uh, arena, but also to link into the uh, justice and the uh, specifically to the health uh, institutions because they can provide a lot of different context and information to the uh, to the reporting process. And finally, in in many of your slides, you put uh, a lot of different uh, something you mentioned that some systems were not designed or or the way we design systems at the beginning may influence the capacity of analysis and the uh, provision of information. So if we from, and, and I, I would like to link your presentation to the, the former one, where mm -hmm. um, Colonel was saying, for example, we should focus on gender-based violence. And sometimes some of the um, systems were designed to provide an emergency, uh, to, to provide something very specific, like an ambulance, because something is happening, or to provide a uh, uh, the firefighters, if we have a fire, but they might not consider some gender violence uh, conditions or contexts that we will need for analyzing or to prevent, uh, not only or to give the uh, the emergency service, but to provide other services. So with with this, just thank you. For, and, and, and maybe just one thing also, because yeah. you presented a lot of different um, the segregations and for and categories and classifications. So, for example, you presented um, uh, several definitions, including in 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 turn um, intimate partner violence, which other people might not be considering. For example, I think you put friends and other acquaintances, and maybe in some other countries and some other um, institutions, they might uh, narrow that definition. So, it's also important to to explain why we are considering those and 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 let me link it again to the first presentation when uh, Colonel was saying we need to have these kind of manuals so we can uh, classify in a standardized way. So Erika, thank you very much for this uh, very kind and generous presentation in terms of slides, but also richness of the process you have uh, developed to, to be in the stage where you are. So um, the last uh, presentation today would be from Mexico, from the National Statistics Office. Uh, Mr. Guillermo Castillo, he is the Deputy General Director on uh, Governance Census, and he will also share uh, a lot of the experience that has been developed in, in Mexico. So, Guillermo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adriana. Hello, good morning, everyone. On behalf of INEGI, it is a great pleasure to share with you the country's experience in terms of police agencies' information uh, or data generation. Let me first share my screen with you. You see it now, correct? I'm going to speak a little bit about the Mexican experience. The presentation is divided in four sections. The first one, I'm going to talk about the international context in terms of these inputs that is that are allowing us to get in the line and orientating in a better fashion the creation of data in police agencies. Then I will speak to you about the national context in the third section, I'm going to be presenting some of the results that are aligned to these contexts. And finally, an informative content regarding the works that we're working on regarding uh, after the publication of the guidelines regarding international context. It's good to mention that from the UN, we have a 
manual that is very relevant for national um, statistic offices as well as for police agencies and governments overall that have to do with the manual to the creation of statistics on criminal justice from the um, years 2000 the UN where providing the invitation on how we needed to start collecting the different institutions that participate in the function of criminal justice and that we needed to account for different aspects in order to create a statistical uh, system from the management planning all the way to research and analysis. Sorry for the interruption. Our interpreter said that we cannot uh, Yes. Uh, what you were saying, what I was saying regarding the international framework takes us to the landing specification of the data regarding police agencies, the publication of the guidelines that uh, that we were discussing today will allow us not only to actually concrete or um, land what it is or ground what it is um, included in the international manual, but to provide data more uh, in more detail regarding police operations and also transparent and comparable data at a local, state, and uh, national level, and more detailed information regarding what police agencies are doing or police officers are doing, which allows us to go into more continuous and systematic data production, more detailed data, and finally will help us to open data, uh, focus on facts. It is very important to visualize uh, uh, police operations because there's a lot of uh, emphasis of what do they do, how many people are arrested, for how uh, what kind of crimes they or offenses, but we understand that police officers do beyond that, do more, much more than that. Uh, they go, they do all the way regarding um, street orders, street. Um, uh, they also deal with uh, daily conflicts. They are also the eyes of the state regarding the maintenance of order. And this is continuously visualized. Nevertheless, regarding the aspect that it go um, that is hidden, it has to do with how do we find uh, police officers. So who are they, where the equipment, the uniforms, whether they have some sort of distinction policy, uh, um, uh, recognition uh, programs, the, the salaries, wedges, benefits, which are very important to understand what is the institutional capacities and the challenges that they are facing. Very importantly, these guidelines allow us to do the synergy between national statistics offices and the um, uh, security, public security institutions, because statistic, statistical agencies uh, produce statistical information and guidelines allow us to orientate actions regarding what needs to be measured and monitored and how do we design these statistics and how do we capture the information, how do we process data and how do we disseminate it. But on the other hand, for police agencies, these are very relevant guidelines because it allows us to uh, capture information that required to understand why are they doing it, how are they doing it, where are they doing it, to detect problems we are facing, to uh, allocate resources more efficiently, to increase accountability, analyzing characteristics of their staff, also to understand in a better fashion the crime trends, to reduce crimes, and finally to have a better supervision regarding the use of force. Now, this is what we are doing at an international regional level. Now, I would like to speak to you about the national context in Mexico. In Mexico, we have the Geographical Statistic Information National System, SNIEG. SNIEG is included in the Constitution since 2006. 
and starting in 2008, a uh, law was passed specifically for this SNEAG. And the most important thing about this message is that this is a system that is coordinated by INEGI, um, and SNEAG has four big pillars. These pillars are called subsystems, and one of them is the government, public security, and justice um, enforcement subsystem. In the subsystem, it's exactly where we can um, where we can say that information is being discussed that deals with different topics, government, human rights, accountability, um, penitentiary system, uh, drug issues, public security, public uh, uh, police officers, so or, or law enforcement. So from INEGI, we create three different, uh, we have three different sources of information. First, the surveys that allow us to understand the data from the uh, popu um, population's perspective and census that allows us to understand what are the institutional capacities and offer information regarding the institutional doing. In the case of the public function, we do not have uh, data, but we do use these data for our uh, strategies. Very quickly, I do want to say that the most relevant surveys for us to understand or measure the police doing, it is in the victimization surveys to residences, which is um, the NVP, or we also use the Business Victimization National Survey, NV. These surveys allows us to understand and monitor the security perception of the population. What are the kind of crimes that they have been victims of? How did, they, did this happen? And antisocial behaviors that they have seen and the trust to public officers. We first um, distinguish the different kinds of police officers that we have in the country, how much they trust them, if they believe they are effective or not, and also the degree of corruptions that they believe that are that is uh, present in these institutions. This is regarding the population or the universe that these um, services been offered. But since 2017, from INEGI, we created um, the ENECAT, which is a survey specifically uh, collecting information regarding police officers from their processes of training, uh, the entering to the police academy, the personnel conditions, health conditions, socio-demographical conditions, interactions with mandates or colleagues in the amongst the institutions, and an endless amount of elements. What it is important to highlight here is that this allows us to supplement the different data from the perspective of the people operating law enforcement, specifically police officers. These were the, regarding the surveys. Now let's go to the government census where we have public security census. These public security uh, national census aim to create statistical and geographical information from the institutions of public security to measure two important aspects. The first one, what has to do with management capacities, meaning that we are trying to respond what are the resources available in these institutions, and on the other hand, the performances. What is these uh, resources are being used for? Uh, um, from this, I'm gonna. I would like to present the most relevant results regarding this topic. I do want to say before that if we put in black and white some of the aspects or sections included in the statistical frameworks for data production from the government census, we can address or provide data, uh, things that are related to human resources, financial resources, physical uh, resources, and staff well-being and health. Regarding criminal statistics, we have the facts of the crimes, the calls of 9-11 received by the police agencies, what it is related to arrest and detention processes, and ceasing operations. In terms of other activities, we also 
create data, what are the actions that police officers do to relate to the citizenship, whether they have the social proximity, et cetera. We have different topics that cover that. And the fourth section, which is behavior, data regarding use of force and fire weapons and professional behavior. This is some of the data that I would like to present to you uh, uh, now. So first of all, we need to acknowledge that we have over 55,000 people working in the uh, law enforcement um, in the law enforcement in the country. So we can say that between like eight out of 10 elements working in the uh, law enforcement institutions are men. Why is that? Because if we compare it with the total population, 55% of the popula population in Mexico are females. So these can definitely speak about the um, the unbalance that we see in the law enforcement and that has to do with victimization or violence against women. This is definitely very important, but within the institutions, it's also important because there might be that the conditions of women, working conditions of uh, police, um, women officers, they can be also a problem in the institution. One other important topic is the age range. While in the federal uh, part, we have these data, most of the police officers and the staff members are between 18 to 24 years old for state and municipality cases. Staff is concentrated after 30 means from 30 to 34 years old. This definitely speaks about a very relevant um, data because in terms of uh, the work environment, what is it important for you to offer to your law enforcement staff? So one more thing that we analyze is the education level. This is the, the the biggest amount of people working in the law, in law enforcement is in the level of high school. Another important input here has to do with the equipment provided to the staff, use of force, less lethal, um, we can say the uh, handcuffs, 42%, the state municipality, 30%, also the use of devices, electroshocking devices. It's very, we see very low provision from the government to the police officers. Weapons, we see that a state level, only 50% of the staff received fire weapons from the state and municipality, 33.3%. Sanctioned police officers, or we have the number of police officers being sanctioned or and what are the kind of conduct that reached or that um, the first one has to do with arrest, fines, destitution, or um, employment, destitution as well. So speaking about the behaviors that we were speaking in the guidelines, we have information regarding those people, those individuals in the public security institutions that have been um, reported for a crime commissioner committing a crime. So the highest number we see it in the municipality level regarding the exercise of the function, meaning getting into the main activities, we go, we can have, we have data that allows to understand that once police officers 
objeto ante la autoridad para comenzar take people or individuals before the authority to start with the criminal justice process we can say that state police officers took over 453,000 people before the public ministry and in the municipality environment we are we have over 1,700,000 uh, individuals before um the the relevant the judiciary and once we take these individuals or these uh, offenders, what we see is we can appreciate different activities in the state and municipality level. Over 60% of these um, individuals taken, it goes to the civil justice, those that are not considered as a crime, but that they can alter the public order. Now, federally, most of the federal authorities take individuals or offenders before the public ministry prosecutors ministry so regarding the civic uh, offenses we have for instance create a scandal or noise that are um this is 26 percent of the reported civic offenses state we have 22 percent municipality 70 percent the main conduct that has been recorded by municipality and the police it is the consumption of alcohol on streets regarding those crimes that were recorded when taking the individuals before the authorities federally we can have the behavior of um, burglary then statally we have crimes against health narcotics and municipality uh burglary again to finish with the number of conflicts that have happened, federal 128, state 4, 444, municipality 881. Here what is important is what happened with this we have data this confrontation. So how many uh, individuals were arrested? How many were uh, killed? So we have the... This, these are some of the data that we have. And I will show to you a practical case for using the information. So if we go over these data, and this is an entity in Mexico, we see in this table the concentration of population, calls to 911, and reported crimes. What you can see in on the first rows are those demarcations or um uh, bureaus where and the percentage of the challenges that police officers face and here what it tells us is where do we have the highest presence and just to look at it what you can see is how not necessarily where we have more agencies or state police stations um are matching where we have the highest number of population, polls, and crime, uh, crimes registers. So there's no, um, no correlationship of where we are finding the problems. And not only that, because if we go to the uh, infrastructure, where are we providing information to the citizenship, this includes, this is more unbalanced, where those installations where more, where we can provide citizenship attention that are not properly, uh, there's no much offering of what there's been challenges of the police. From the INEGI, from INEGI, we have a tool that allows us to go through this analysis. And what you're looking at right here, and this is at a polygon level where 
emergency incidents are happening recorded by the calls of 911 and the dots tells us where police stations are located that this is uh, state and federal stations and these are some of the inputs that we can connect and to use for um, do the synergy between the statistical uh, agencies and the police agencies and this takes me to the message I want to convey uh, for the guided by the Center of Excellence from the UNODC. Uh, different states will be working on the implementation of the guideline that it's providing guidelines of the police agencies for the production of data. When I speak about working in implementation is that we're in, and we are interested in working and creating a learning community in order to con to uh, generate data, understand the curiosity and how does this information is being used for decision making. And we need to understand what is a minimum baseline to be in place regarding the use of guidelines that are being provided, what are the existing practices in the region so we can trigger technical collaboration not only among uh, police agencies and statistical uh, agencies, but also among the states. And what something important that we are going to be working on is to transfer into things that are related to uh, human rights. This is work. This is a work that we're doing from the CESEPAL perspective, and that is going to be that we're going to be working on it for the following two years. With that, uh, so this is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Guillermo, for this long and detailed uh, tour to the different sources of information that show the work that the INEGI has been done for over 15 years to create information from the different perspectives from people or individuals that might become victims of a crime, but also to remember that the people working in um, public agencies need to be well trained and um, uh, recognized. So this is a different experience from when Erica commented, but where you highlight the fact that we need to pay attention of what is the training and capacities that we have to build in the staff. So we have time to go over the questions that we have received. Lieutenant, maybe we can go first with you. You were asked for a reflection regarding the use of indicators. Depending on how they've been used, they can provide a negative perspective of a phenomenon and maybe calling the attention that how careful users have to be when going over the data because we need to see what are the reference periods and this shows us or forces us to create tools, supplementary tools so we can actually understand what data mean under which context this was um, produced and to do proper analysis within proper context. Thank you very much for the floor. I completely agree with you because, as I said in my presentation, there is a big amount of um, uh, a big figure of crimes that have not been reported, which definitely have a positive and negative impact, both. When we create better, uh, when we build better citizen trust, people will trust their institutions better and they will create more reports. So when we present data, we see that the incidences have increased and it's not necessarily that there is more crime in a specific sector, but that the trust from the institutions increased, which create more reporting from the citizenship. And sometimes this has an, an opposite impact. Sometimes people just stop 
reporting and crimes in the data mean uh, might seem to have much lower violence or criminal activity or an improvement in a territory. So that's very clear. So that's why one of the data that I told you to use is we need to start using data from other places, other sources to contrast, as Guillermo mentioned, 9-11 and other calls because this is the, before uh, vulgaries or crimes that we might be losing because we are still working on building automa automated systems that are proper to be used at a regional level. And yes, this is the data that we're still not using. So community assembly data is very important because when we go to the territory and we go and ask the, the assembly, they provide a lot of valuable piece of information that we're not using it, that we're not analyzing. and. We, it is not being used to match it with the formal reporting or before the prosecutor's office. So social media, again, this is something to be considered because now it's much easier or people feel it's much better and more dynamic, let's say, using social media to report certain incidences or crimes that are happening. And because they are not trusting institutions, they are not going through the formal channels. So the big question, I agree with it, but this is one of the big challenges challenges that we need to start building upon and to cross check data and from different sources of information to actually understand whether whether we are improving security in one territory or the um or trust increased or decreased thank you lieutenant also, uh, regarding Guillermo's presentation, of how important it is to get different sources of information that describe not only different phenomena, but also different pieces of information that are supplementary to understand what's actually going on at different um at, at the same time in different institutions. Erica, let me pass it over to you. You have several questions regarding your presentation. If you were okay. able to, to read them and if you're kind of eager to share some insights uh, to those questions. Sure, um, in terms of, I think I, I actually answered one in the chat earlier too, but let me see, make sure I, I hit on some of these things. Um, yeah, so I see a question related to um, sort of what happens um, down, sort of downstream from the incident actually being reported. So it's actually what, I, from my perspective, um, it, it seeing how the systems are established at the local level and then how the data move through, um, that if it is an, a crime incident that is actually recorded in a law enforcement agency system, then typically some type of response from the police department has occurred. Um, the big space of, of sort of um, lack, or I guess we have a lack of knowledge, I should say, at the front end of that particular um, set of data, which is if someone calls the police about something, it really doesn't even matter what it is. And they they may, the, the citizen may believe that there's some type of um, crime that's been committed. If the law enforcement agency responds, but they determine either there no crime has occurred um, or that it is something other than a crime, right? Um, even if they have to respond in some way, it's not gonna show up in the system. So NIBRS doesn't really, that system maintained at the federal level doesn't really have an ability right now to provide us insight into the discretion of the law enforcement agency to make that an incident in and of itself. So um, that's one of the challenges um, I see with uh, the crime data in and up, you know, sort of generally. And, you know, I know we could probably all three of us uh, of the presentations have talked about, you know, the as, you know, aspects of this issue related to training and related to how the data are reported, you know, how, how the information gets in the system and then how it gets out and, and bubbles up to the top. 
Um, but I do think some of that is related to what Guillermo was speaking about regarding training and making sure that not only officers who enter the data understand um, the implications of what they're putting in the system, but then also the folks who do the reviews at the various stages in the process, the sar you know, the, the shift sergeants and, you know, anyone else in the is sort of um, responsible for validation, but then also record staff who have to go through and make sure that that information is actually coded appropriately. So there's a lot and it's, and it's a tough sell for law enforcement, especially, I'm not sure um, how this is viewed in other countries, but um, we have a real challenge in terms of culture in uh, a number of agencies in the United States where it's this feeling of like, I signed up to be a law enforcement official, not a data collector. And so how do you, how do we start to sell the message that that is a really integral part of the function that you serve so that we, you safeguard yourself and your agency, but you're also providing insight to the citizenry that you, you serve by, pro by providing them these data. So I think it's a, it's a big challenge all around, but it sounds like we're all kind of really tackling some of the same issues, which it doesn't surprise me, but it's still a little bit heartening to hear that we can all learn from each other. Thanks, Erica, for this uh, very comprehensive answer. And uh, Guillermo. We have two questions for you. If you can share with us the link to the geo viewer that we that you shared in your presentation for those that are interested in accessing or play with the data and to see the potential of the tool and the information gathered in the system and an open question for all of you for the three of you so and i also would answer as part of institutions what are institutions doing to improve the opportunity for data to be used at different times and for the different interventions either from institutions emergency institutions as it was mentioned maybe to create an immediate response but from the analysis or leveraging these databases, they could create it for others' attention services, such as maybe uh, serving uh, institutions that work for violence against women or other institutions. Guillermo, maybe we can go with you, reflecting on some of the questions, then Lieutenant, and then we go with Erica for your listening to your insights. Thank you, Adriana. So I just want to highlight the importance of these guidelines for national statistics um, agencies as well as police agencies to work together and improve the data that are precisely fundamental, not only from the perspective of what they do, but internally how they've been generated and how they are being used for the operations in the police department. So I think that's relevant. And taking what Erica said, it is quite surprising to still seeing the lack of relevance given to the data. Usually, if police officers have $100 to spend, they, it is, they, the, the perspective is not that um, useful to have statistical, an appropriate statistical department or people that are, um, that are specialists in data analysis or data production. They'd rather use these money for I don't know, more practical or exercising activities such as uh, uh, or buying new cars or uh, things like that. But I think that data allows us to allocate resources better instead of just using gas and spending all uh, rounding around the city. I think that you can do much better use of resources where you can uh, patrol in those places where you know that police intervention is more important, things like that. I think that this is the big challenge that's still to be addressed. And the dialogue between statistical people and operators is fundamental so we can transfer to a better use of information. I also want to mention how relevant it is to use the, the information produced in the 9-11 uh, hotline. 
Guillermo, also because you have the floor, uh, I want to ask you a reflection on how can we convey to people that want to use this information, the part that, uh, that Erica mentioned during her presentation about the different stages of the follow-up of a crime that can start with a incident with certain characteristics and how does the analysis or data production moves to different institutions from the 9-11 phone call, how the uh, investigation continues, how is the crime prosecuted, how is the person arrested, how do they get to a uh, criminal justice pr procedure, so maybe you want to have the data of what happens first and then what happens at the end. But when we are actually including different administrative and legal frameworks, uh, uh, institutions, and how important it is to coordinate these institutions, but that it also means that I don't want to say a delay, but it would definitely take some time from the moment that a fact happened and what is actually happening throughout this. This is the kind of analysis that can only be achieved once the administrative records of the different institutions have some sort of way to communicate among themselves. We know that what is going to happen in the records of the police officers is not the same of what is going to appear in the prosecutor's offices or at the courts or the penitentiary systems as well. So we know by practice that each institution is generating data orientated to their own objectives. And it is quite rare those opportunities where we see the interest of collecting data from and, and linking uh, these um, or having the different links of the chain. This is one of the best contributions that we can have from the statistical uh, office perspective, because from this project of criminal justice data and follow up by the UN, this would allow us to have traceability of a case. One event, one incident can have one or more victims, one or more crimes, and one or more offenders or perpetrators. So the follow-up of these cases is going to vary. That's why it's so, so important to have administrative um, records that are solid, allow us, allowing us to go throughout the different stages. So that would be the most important thing to account for when we speak about sources of information. Thank you, Guillermo. So in the chat box and um, referring to your intervention on how to use other existing databases that might have not been leveraged statistically, such as 9-11 that Lieutenant also mentioned during his first intervention, we have included a link of a conversation of a, that is being organized by the Organization of American States. And in the Center of Excellence, we're going to be presenting a study case where we experience a database in Mexico regarding 9-11 calls and using the artificial intelligence technology is allowing us to identify the potential for characterizing uh, crimes with a um, perspective of, of uh, gender and taking what Erica said during her second intervention, which allows the design of the conceptualization of the emergency system in the territory and that using new technologies allows us to identify or address those cases that in other, uh, in other circumstances, it would be completely lost. So, Lieutenant, you spoke about the training or capacities for police officers. Maybe introduce you the second question after uh, Coronel uh, Villamarín. About the, if, if you can tell us a little bit of the experience of these using your own numbers you mentioned. So it's, it's not only asking or collecting data from different institutions, but it's also giving them back the, the sense of why it does matter to have their information uh, standardized, uh, collected, and, uh, and and also you mentioned you are introducing data visualization techniques to reduce the complexity of some data 
So give them, give them, giving back this uh, data to the institution so they can use them for their own activities. So just to to open the discussion for you, and uh, firstly, I will back with the coroner. Coroner, si me pudiera comentar algo sobre los Lieutenant, if you can talk to us about the training uh, processes. In Red Bull. So training is fundamental, I believe, and uh, I believe in the specialization in police agencies because something that I was not able to say, it's, and it's a big problem, it's rotation of staff rotation, like we train and we specialize analysts and as Erica said it's not only the analyst it has to be the analyst supervisor the chief everyone needs to be properly trained and deeply understand the topic so they can take better decisions in accordance with the data they have received. So one of the issues that we see is a lot of rotation. So you have a person that has been properly trained, specialized, and then we said, okay, this person needs to move and go to another. So we get a new person and we start all over again. So that's one of the biggest issues that we face at a regional level, but also, uh, and going back to your question, I think training, it's, fundamental and it has to be done from a holistic perspective and it needs to have or, or provide the perspective of the neighbors because we might have similar problems regarding security i know and as i said during my presentation territories are different because of cultural characteristics gastronomy uh, geographically they all have an influence in the different territories but in some sort of way good practices that we have in the region needs to be shared and these are how do we share them this is through training i think that this is fundamental and red ball has a, has education as a pillar in presence as well as virtually and um, right now for instance i'm in lima but we are doing train the trainers program for immigrants and people trafficking that are uh, for police officers or agents that are uh, dealing with these um, topics. So in order to have a, a good levering of skills, I think it's very important. So to end with your question, I think that we have two specific topics to account for. Number one, people to, to specialize and they have to remain in the position because they have already been trained and specialized. And the second topic, and as you said it, to exchange good practices and start knowing what other countries are doing, what worked for them, what did not work for them, so we don't uh, uh, commit the same errors. Erika, uh, I'm sorry uh, if you can just uh, briefly conclude or share uh, very quickly an insight because we are running out of time and maybe I was super excited trying to to, to use and, and build a little bit more upon the experience. But if you can kindly help us to finish the, uh, the session briefly and give us the last uh, feedback. Sorry, the last question for you was about the the, tra uh, the training for uh, the giving back the the training to to the institutions you are collecting the information from because you Thank mentioned you, that you're giving back a training uh, using their own. So if you can just uh, briefly comment on that and we can close, or if you want, we can just finish here. So it's sure. Okay. Sorry, no, I um, sorry to to build up on the uh, the 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 amount of information you share. No, 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 that's okay. I just uh, couldn't get my mouse to get to the mute button. So um, sorry, that's the downfall of technology. Um, yeah, so one of the, we're really focused on trying to make it worthwhile for agencies to actually submit these data. 
Um, you know, we started going out to law enforcement agencies directly and working with them on the transition. Um, geez, probably like in late, mid to late 2014. So it's been a long time and, and a consistent refrain is, as as both Guillermo um, and uh, the colonel had mentioned, you know, that this is, it's expensive and they don't want to spend their money on this because there are a million other things and budgets are small. So the big question has been like, well, what do I get for my money? Um, and right now, to be honest with you, it's really hard to tell them what that is. I mean, I'm, I've been working at this for a really long time and it's a still a very hard question for me to answer. Um, so we're trying to put some things out into the public sphere that make it a little bit more useful. And we're really focused on those agencies that don't have big budgets and big capacity. So we're not necessarily focused on the NYPDs and the Chicago Police Departments of the United States. We're talking about those agencies that are, you know, serving city, you know, populations of under 250,000 where there's smaller numbers of officers and they don't necessarily have the same amount of civilian capacity in terms of staffing. So um, our hope is that we can establish this platform and I'd be happy to walk anybody through it in terms of how we're doing things analytically and, and you know, sort of using our own internal technology to be able to you know, bring data in, do some transformations with it, and then kick back a report to them and the our, our initial turnaround time, we're shooting for 10 minutes or less, um, and that'll get faster over time. So it'll be something that is like, hey, I want a report on motor vehicle theft. They would be able to get one of those from us, um, even if they don't have a crime analyst of their own. So it's, it's one way to give something back. I'm not sure, you know, certainly it'll resonate with some and not others, but we'll just keep plugging away. I mean, I think that's, that's something I, I hear definitely across all three of us is that we're just trying, you know, we're doing everything we can to try to make the burden a little bit easier um, and, and report out good information. So uh, hopefully if you have ideas for me, please send them my way. I'm happy to hear them. Thank you so much. We can okay, back so sure we're so. going to adjourn the session here. Thank you to our presenters, not only for sharing your experiences, but also to elaborate in, in those um, insights. We did not lose any attendees during the session, so that was great. And this gives us more to talk about for next year. Thank you very much to all of you that joined us today. Thank you again.